When Meriton shaved himself next morning he laughed at the reflection that the mirror cast back at him. For he looked for all the world as though he had been up all night and his knee was painful and rather stiff, as though he had strained some ligament in it. Beastly place is beginning to make its mark on me already, he said, as he lathered his chin. My eyes look as though they had been stuck in with burnt cork, and the devil take my shaky hand. And that railroad business yesterday helps it along. A nice state of affairs for a chap of my age, I must say. Scared as a kid at an old wives' story. Borkins is a fool, and I'm an idiot. Damn. There's a bit off my chin for a start. I hope to goodness no one takes it into their heads to pay me a visit today. His hopes, however, in this direction were not to be realized, for as the afternoon wore itself slowly away in a ramble round the old place, and through the stables, which in their day had been famous at the big, harsh-throated doorbell rang, and Meryton, in the very act of telling Borkins that he was officially not in, happened to catch a glimpse of something light and fluffy through the stained glass of the door, and suddenly kept his counsel. A few seconds later Borkins ushered in two visitors. Meryton, prepared by the convenient glass for the appearance of one was nevertheless not unpleased to see the other. For the names that Borkins rolled off his tongue with much relish were those of Miss Brellier and Mr. Brellier, sir. His Lady of the Thrice-Blessed Wreck His Lady of the Dainty Accent and Glorious Eyes his face glowed suddenly and he crossed the big room in a couple of strides and in the next second was holding Antoinette's hand rather longer than was necessary, and was looking down into the roguish green and grey eyes that had captivated him only yesterday, when for one terrible, glorious moment he had held her in his arms, while the railroad coach dissolved around them. "'Are you fit to be about?' he said, his voice ringing with the very evident pleasure that he felt at this meeting with her and his eyes wandering to where a strip of pink court plaster upon her forehead showed faintly through the screen of hair that covered it. Then he dropped her hand and turned toward the man who stood a pace or two behind her tiny figure, looking at him with the bluest, youngest eyes he had ever looked into. Mr. Brellier, is it not? Very good of you, sir, to come across in this neighborly fashion. Won't you sit down? Yes, said Antoinette, gaily, my uncle. I brought him right over by telling him of our adventure. The man was tall and heavily built, with a wealth of black hair thickly streaked with grey, and a trim, well-kept imperial which gave him the foreign air that his name carried out so well. His morning suit was extremely well cut, and his whole bearing that of the well-to-do man about town. Meriton registered all this in his mind's eye and was secretly very glad of it. They were two thoroughbreds that was easy to see. And as for Antoinette? Well, he could barely keep his eyes from her. She was lovelier than ever, and clad this afternoon in all the fluffy femininity that every man loves. Anything more intoxicatingly delicious Meriton had never seen outside of his own dreams. It was certainly ripping of you both to come, he said nervously, feeling all hands and feet. Never saw such a lonely spot in all my life, by George, as this house. It fairly gives you the creeps. Indeed? Brellier laughed in a deep, full-throated voice. For my part the loneliness is what so much appeals to me. When one has spent a busy life traveling to and fro over the world, Emsur, one can but appreciate the peaceful backwaters which are so often to be found in this very dear, very delightful England of yours. But that is not the mission upon which I come. I have to thank you, sir, for the great kindness and consideration you displayed to my niece yesterday. His English was excellent, and he spoke with the clipped, careful accent of the foreigner, which Meriton found fascinating. He had already succumbed to something of the same thing in Antoinette. He was beginning to enjoy himself very much indeed. There was no need for thanks, none at all. What is your opinion of the towers, Miss Brellier? he asked suddenly, leaning forward toward her, anxious to change the conversation. She shrugged her shoulders. 
That is hardly a fair question to ask, she responded, when I have been in it but a matter of five minutes or more. But everything to me is enchanting. The architecture, the furnishings, the very atmosphere. BRRH If you could have been here last night. He gave a mock shudder and broke it with a laugh. Why, a truly haunted house wasn't a patch on it. If this place hasn't got a ghost, well then I'll eat my hat. I could fairly hear M, dozens and dozens of them, clinking and clanking all over the place. And if you could see my room. I sleep in a four-poster as big as a suburban villa, and every now and again the furniture gives a comfy little crack or two, like someone practicing with a pistol, just to remind me that my great-great-great-grandmother's ghost is sitting in the wardrobe and watching over me with true great etc. grandmotherly conscientiousness. I say, do you ride? There ought to be some rip and rides round here, if my memory doesn't fail me. She nodded, and the conversation took a turn that Sir Nigel found more than pleasant, and the time passed most agreeably. Meryton, only anxious to entertain his guests, suddenly exploded the bomb which shattered that afternoon's enjoyment for all three of them. By the way, he remarked, last night, while I was lying awake I saw a lot of funny flames dancing up and down upon the horizon. Seemed as though they lay in the marshes between your place and mine, Mr. Brellier. Borkins pulled a long story about M with all the usual trimmings. Said they were supernatural and all that. Ever seen M yourself? I must say they gave me a bit of a turn. I'm not keen on spirits, except in bottle form, which by the way is a rotten bad pun, Miss Brellier, but in India one gets chockful of that sort of thing and there never seems to be any rational explanation. It leaves you feeling funny. What's your opinion of M? For seen M you must have done, as they seem to be the talk of the whole village from what Borkin says. Antoinette's spoon tinkled in the saucer of the teacup she was holding and her face went white. Brellier shifted his eyes. A sort of tension had settled suddenly over the pleasant room, I well, to tell you the truth, I can't explain M myself. Brellier said at last, clearing his throat with signs of genuine nervousness. They seem to be inexplicable. I have seen them, yes, many, many times. And so has Toinette, but the stories afloat about them are rather unpleasant, and like a wise man I have kept myself free of investigation. I do hope you'll do the same, Sir Nigel. One never knows, and although one cannot always believe the silly things which the villagers prattle about, it is as well to be on the safe side. As you say, these things sometimes lack a rational explanation. I should be sorry to think you were likely to run into any unnecessary danger. He bent his head and Meryton could see that his fingers twitched. Borkins actually told me stories of people who had disappeared in a mysterious manner and were never found again he remarked casually. Brellier shrugged his shoulders. He spread out his hands. Among the uneducated, what would you? But it is so, even since I myself have been in residence at Withersby Hall, something like three and a half years, there have been several mysterious disappearances, Sir Nigel, and all directly traceable to a foolhardy desire to investigate these phenomena. For myself, I leave well enough alone. I trust you are going to do likewise? His eyes searched Meryton's face anxiously. There was a worried furrow between his brows. Meryton laughed, and at the sound, Toinette, who had sat perfectly still during the discussion of the mystery, gave a little cry of alarm and covered her ears with her hands. I beg of you, she broke out excitedly. Please, please do not talk about it. The whole affair frightens me. Uncle will laugh I know, but I am terrified of those little flames, Sir Nigel, more terrified than I can say. If you speak of them any more, I must go really. Please, please don't dream of trying to find out what they are, Sir Nigel. It, it would upset me very much indeed if you attempted so foolish a thing. 
Meryton's first sensation at hearing this was pleasure that he was capable of upsetting her over his own personal welfare. Then the something sinister about the whole story, which seemed to affect everyone with whom he came into touch, swept over him. A number of otherwise rational human beings scared out of their wits over some mysterious flames on the edge of the fens at night time, seemed, in the face of this glorious summer's afternoon, to be little short of ridiculous. He tried to throw the idea off but could not. Toinette's pale face kept coming before him, the sudden dropping of her spoon struck an unpleasant chord in his memory. Brellier's attitude merely added fuel to the fire and soon they rose to go, Meriton following them to the door. Don't forget, then, Miss Brellier, that you are booked to me for a ride on Thursday, he said, laughingly. She nodded to him and gave his hand a little squeeze at parting. I shall not forget, Sir Nigel. But, you will promise me, her voice dropped a tone or two, you will promise me that you will not try and find out what those, those flames are, won't you? I could not sleep if you did. And they were gone. Meriton stood a while in silence, his brows puckered and his mouth stern. First Borkins, and then Brellier, and now Kerr. All of them begging him almost upon their knees to forego a perfectly harmless little quest of discovery. There seemed to his mind something almost fishy about it all. What then were these frozen flames? What secret did they hide? And what malignant power dwelt behind the screen of their mystery?